inviting me. So, um, as Kate has, thought, has said, I've been asked to say something about the large meerkat uh, survey proposals that uh, have been allocated already and have started to begin working towards getting them into action. I will not say anything, obviously, about the Meerkat, the SKA Phase 1, the Construction, Infrastructure, and Human Capacity Development, because I uh, assume that you were all here when Justin Jonas talked about that. And so my structure is, uh, the structure of the talk is as follows. Um, I will actually first start with saying something about, but very broad, about the main science goals of the SKA, because many of the projects that we are currently starting with Meerkat are not just using a precursor of the SKA to do science and test the technology, but are also partly the first steps towards those science goals on a, on a much smaller scale. So I'll introduce those science goals, then I'll uh, quickly see how the Meerkat rollout is and the large surveys were assigned. There's actually 10 of them that have gotten time, 10 large international collaborations. But I'll mainly focus on saying a bit more about four projects, four of these, because those are the ones that I'm most familiar with because they are led or co-led by uh, researchers at UCT. And I'll also show, um, because we do have the SKA, we do have the Meerkat as a precursor, but we also have the CAT7, which you see a image down here, and that's actually already being used for some observations uh, in this year, and uh, can actually also be regarded as uh, my, uh, uh, minor steps towards getting up this scale over here. And I also have to thank quite a lot of my collaborators at UCT for lending me a number of their slides, so particularly Claude Garignon and, uh, and Patrick Wout. And so let us, let us start from where kind of the radio, um, <coughs> radio astronomy kind of started. What we have down here is one of the uh, is a telescope that was built in 1956 in Dwingelo in Holland. Uh, well, it was for three months, uh, it was the largest telescope in the world, <laughs> and uh, it actually stayed working quite long, because in the 90s I used it for a very, la a very large program to observe that. But then uh, the evolution, and you actually see here kind of the time scales from when radio astronomy started, this one is even over here, and kind of the telescope size and development. Anyway, soon thereafter, we had telescopes over here, like the 64-meter dish um, that was actually used. It was built, I think, in 1961. It was used to follow the Apollo mission in 69. We have the Green Bank Telescope, which is comparable to the Effelsberg Telescope. And these are the largest fully steerable radio telescopes that we have with 100 meter. The, la the next larger one is the Arecibo, which you know is um, in... Uh, is uh, fixed in the ground and so not steerable but it is the largest single dish that we have. And that kind of developed until, until the uh, 1970s. Big steps were then made with the interferometers that were not so much, extremely much larger in aperture but they spread their telescope and used interferometry to improve on the resolution and that kind of brings us over here where very good science has been done. And then what happened in 1990 was that the first discussions were actually started, what is the next kind of step of radio telescope that we want and can actually do really leading um, science with and, and, and answer some of the questions that we can't resolve with the kind of telescopes that we have. And it was in the 1990s that the step was conceived to build a radio telescope that's a whole order of magnitude larger than current existing telescopes, and that obviously is uh, the SKA, and here is uh, some design of how it's going to look like, and it's a combination of dishes and uh, dense aperture arrays. These are the things that we're gonna get in, in <coughs> South Africa, and then the sparse aperture arrays over here. So that was, started in the planning in 1990s and obviously it doesn't quite help you apart from designing this, this huge instrument and de developing the technology 
to just go to some funders and say, well, I want a telescope that's an order of magnitude larger, that doesn't quite uh, bring it. So um, some of the more uh, well-known radio astronomers came together and actually said the science that we can do with such a telescope, what is it and is it important enough that we can do that and that's taken a long time and has been published in 2004, the whole series of projects uh, led by uh, Chris Carilli and Steve Rawlings to identify the main research projects that the SKA and only the SKA can actually attack and answer some of the most important questions that we, uh, or not only the most important, but some of the questions that only this, this telescope can, can resolve or, or lead steps in there. And I'll talk to you through some of these, but only very briefly going uh, along this uh, way. And I'll say a bit more about um, this one. Here we have galaxy evolution, cosmology, and dark energy is one of the science cases and one of the things that the SKA will be very good at, and the Meerkat will be a very good precursor for that, is surveys for neutral atomic hydrogen. So, um, as you know, atomic hydrogen is the most frequent and abundant element in the universe. It's the one source that we need to have uh, star formation. It drives galaxy evolution in various environments. Uh, but we actually don't know very much about the cosmic evolution of H1. We know that it all started from there. We know how much we have nowadays, but in between we actually do not know very much because the emission from um, the H1 from the gas is very weak even for very large uh, radio telescopes. The other driver is to learn more about galaxy formation and evolution, and here people are not so much looking at the gas, the neutral gas itself, but looking at the continuum to learn more about galaxy formation and particularly about a lot of the extreme actions um, like uh, <coughs> the jets and supermassive black holes in galaxies and, and the growth of, of structures, and that's one of that. There's obviously also a cosmology aspect to that. Um, we still don't understand all the cosmological parameters very well, and in particular the dark energy parameter um, W. So these are also science goals that fall into this uh, larger scheme of galaxy evolution, cosmology, and dark energy. Then the other is actually testing kind of the physics in extreme environments, so that strong field test of gravity with pulsars and black holes. So here um, we will test the, the gravity fields, the strong gravity fields along, along pulsars. It's expected that with the SKA sensitivity will lead to a discovery of about 20,000 pulsars and there will also be observations of the gravitational wave background are looking at these millisecond pulsar cosmic gravitational wave detectors. And what is particularly important and what's also already starting up with Meerkat will be the sensitivity to merging massive black holes in early epoch of uh, galaxy formation. I'll say about a bit more about that later on. Some of the um, um, other three main um, science goals of the SKA, and it's one that are not really strongly aimed at with uh, the Meerkat proposals, though partly they do, is uh, one is cosmic magnetism. We all know that magnets exist. We know that the Earth has a magnetic field, and we're very thankful for that because it protects us quite a bit. Um, but um, and we see it everywhere in the universe. We know that magnets are important when we have star formation, when we have AGNs. It all plays a role. It plays back in the feeding of how things are growing. But we really don't understand it at all. And one of those uh, strong science drivers for the SKA is actually to create 3D maps of the cosmic magnetic, magnetic field through partly through rotation measure and also polarization studies and learn much more about where did it come from and how does it influence the physics of many of the observations that we have and do not fully understand. <coughs> One that's very popular is called the cradle of life, the search for life and planets. Um, one is just looking and searching for protoplanetary disks and, uh, and molecules in, in space, 
And the other is obviously the big question, are we alone in the universe and the SKA can detect extraterrestrial signals. It will actually be so powerful that it can uh, detect kind of a airport radar on a planet about 50 light years away. So that will open up a kind of interesting um, listening to what's out there. And uh, the next um, point is the Dark Ages uh, questions and how and when were the first black holes and stars formed and what was actually first? Was it stars or was it black holes or was it larger structures and what kind of sizes? And we actually do not know that and it's called the Dark Ages because the SKA can probe all the way back and, and look at the gas before the universe uh, lit up and looked at the first luminous objects and so called the, the epoch of reionization. So that's a very important uh, issue. And then the sixth one is um, something that they uh, call sometimes Rumsfeld theory number three, the unknown unknowns. So actually looking at things that um, we don't know that we don't know, so to speak, because with a, a telescope like the SKA, you'll get a whole lot of uh, big new parameter space. We have greater sensi sensitivity, resolution, large instantaneous field of view, big survey speed. But we also will, and I presume you heard some of that yesterday as well, uh, fast computing uh, power, uh, real-time analysis, so we can uh, try to follow many of these very transient events right practically when they're happening and following them up. So it is expected, though it's also not one of the things that you can sell really well, just saying I want a larger telescope, I want to explore something, because I'm sure if it's large I'll expect something really exciting that doesn't work. But experience has shown that that's actually what is happening, that some of the major results that come from a large telescope are not necessarily the ones that you have made it for. <clears throat> so those are kind of the big science goal and the big questions that the SKA um, will want to answer. And if you're interested, this is all written up in, in this, uh, um, in this uh, paper in this, uh, from the new astronomy, uh, new uh, reviews. But again, if we go back towards this plot, and then see where we are over here. We have kind of this, this thing over here, but we already know that it's only going to start over here, that we actually will start observing with the SKA. So there's a huge step still to go. This has been the development since, since kind of the inception of the idea. We still have to go a very long way to doing that and get the technology right, develop the technology, de develop how we're actually going to work with this incoming data set and, and the kind of telescopes that we need. And so what, what is happening is obviously you cannot take that step in one go and then get it right. So um, we have to look at this a square kilometer array. It's a massive engineering project question is how do we get from here to there and that's where these SKA pathfinders come in. So they're kind of smaller, very small versions of an SKA but still very large radio telescope. The pathfinders are um, <coughs> telescopes that have a new design that can work towards the science goals that we want to achieve with the SKA and will be telescopes that are really fantastic in their own right. And so some of the more important ones um, are listed over here. One is obviously our own Meerkat that's currently under construction in the northern Peru in South Africa. As you know, it will have 64 uh, dishes of 13.5 meters and will be the, the first part of the SKA phase one. We also have ASCAT that's being built in, in Australia, <coughs> and that will be 36 dishes of 12 meters, I think. Um, <coughs> it's smaller than Meerkat, <coughs> but it has a new, um, uh, what is called the phased array feed at its receiver that allows it to have an incredible large field of view. And so its survey speed is very, very fast because of that. But it will be more shallow than in its observations that it's good for, 
than Meerkat. So in that sense, Meerkat has a small field of view. These two are complementary. And in the north, we also have two developments. The one is LOFAR. It's a telescope that's particularly aimed at very low frequency, as is one of the, uh, um, uh, the part that <coughs> SKA will also have, but in, in Australia. And the other is Aperitif, that's also one of these focal plane arrays and will be mounted on the Westerbork interferometer. And the nice thing about this, this is kind of in between these two surveys, but it is in the north, so it's also complementary to these two. So there's a whole lot of, of uh, pathfinders that are starting up, are under construction, and will start science uh, quite soon. And so let me here start and then go on to what do we have and what we will get with Meerkat and what will be happening with Meerkat. So as you know, uh, Meerkat, it will have 64 dishes over an 8 kilometer baseline. You see the design over here, how these 64 dishes will be spread around. And this in the geographical advantage region where uh, that's protected for the SKA over there. It will be 13.5 um, meter Gregorian offset um, design with a single pixel receiver. And what is important is for us that um, this telescope will be very powerful. It will be the most sensitive centimeter wavelength instrument in the southern hemisphere until the SKA starts working. So we will get here a very powerful radio telescope with which until the SKA comes along, we can do excellent um, science with it. And then <clears throat> as another point, before we even go to Meerkat, there is a precursor to Meerkat. All, all takes steps, uh, little steps to get to the largest size, and that's the Cat 7. As you can see, there is an image over here of the Cat 7. The seven telescopes are standing. They have been designed and constructed here by the Cat office here in, in, in Pinelands, just across the Lees Bay. The telescopes were completed in December 2010. The science verification started mid last year. And uh, there's actually already coming quite a bit of nice um, results out of it. Not just that these are, that it's been commissioned, that it's working well, but it's actually been commissioned with so-called science verification phase. And actually the science that's coming out is already quite interesting science. And I'll show you some of those uh, as we go along a little bit later. Here's a continuum observation of uh, 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 radio source in the Norma cluster and is the velocity field of a um, nearby dwarf galaxy. So <clears throat> this is kind of um, the thing that if we look at the kind of the rollout from where we go from what we have now, the CAT7, to the Meerkat and to the SKA phase one. Um, here we have time. If we look at the CAT7, we know it has been constructed, it has been commissioned, it has done science verification and is actually being used for science now. It's actually, even though it was an engineering project only, it's actually working so well that a lot of the scientists who are preparing for the largest surveys with Meerkat want to keep using it if they can to learn from that. So whether this will actually happen to keep working for the next three years or so is uncertain because if some if you keep a telescope running it costs people, it needs maintenance, etc. etc. And we also have a meerkat to build and prepare for the SKA phase one. So that should actually be kind of a question mark in here. Um, with the Meerkat, I think you've heard that probably yesterday from uh, Justin, uh, design studies for this uh, uh, Gregorian offset uh, telescope are being led. It is uh, thought that the first telescope should be up by the end of next year. And then it goes actually very fast. I'm not sure who's going to do all the dish verifications and, and all the tests that need to be done. But then a further 16 dishes, 2014 and 2015, 64 dishes should be complete. And then it is expected that we will have science operations for five years to be used with this telescope. 
while the continuation for the SKA phase one should be the 10% SKA, that the, the, the design will continue over here. It will be construction will start, that's the thought, during that the science operation are, are, are starting. But again, the time scale and the design studies here, there's still some uh, question marks over there how that will work. Uh, <clears throat> what about the meerkat science then? Um, even though the telescope, as I said before, will only start being operational in from 2016 onwards, um, the, the projects that will be done on them are so large and, and will require a lot of preparation for them. So actually a call for proposals to work with meerkat for large programs, only large programs that use about a thousand hours or more per project, has already gone out the end of 2009 to the whole international community, even though Meerkat is a telescope that's built with South African funds, but it's something that's quite common in radio astronomy, that actually open access to the telescopes. About 21 proposals were submitted to use the Meerkat for big projects, um, different international um, teams with 500 astronomers in total um, from all around the world, including 60 uh, South Africans. And out of these, 10 survey projects were allocated time, and it's about 43,000 hours of time to 10 projects, five of which have a South African PI or a co-PI. And so that's, uh, that's a lot of time, and it's not all the time in the five years, it's about 70% of the time. There will be, the other 30% will be opened in due time to the community to do smaller projects or also allow for testing or rapid science cases on a small uh, Projects. The science objectives uh, of the selected projects are mostly consistent with the prime science drivers of the SKA, um, confirming Meerkat is a real SKA precursor. And so these 10 um, projects are over here. I won't talk you through all of them. And I see that you can't really see the colors over here. But what we have over here is the title of the project, the principal investigator, and the number of hours that are allocated to the project, and then uh, a short um, description. The first two projects over here, the Radio Pulsar Timing and the LADUMA, they're called Priority One Objects, so they have been regarded as the most essential signs that needs to be done with Meerkat. Again, they're very much aligned with the SKA science, because the first one will look at <coughs> pulsars testing Einstein's theory of gravity and gravitational radiation uh, and so forth. And the LADUMA is actually one that's being co-led by Sarah Blythe from UCT, 5,000 allocate hours allocated. And uh, one of the deepest surveys in H1, so the neutral gas, that will be done with uh, the Meerkat, or probably one of the largest one that will be done until the SKA <coughs> comes along. And so there's other, other uh, um, projects that are focused on uh, H1 and galaxies and galaxies in different environments, so part of, of what we know from um, the SKA science case. There's the Mongoose um, that looks actually at <coughs> very individual, very nearby galaxies. There's the Fornax cluster, um, part of this as well. So again, looking at H1 in nearby clusters of, of, of galaxies. And um, if you look then down here, um, we also have the ones from the continuum surveys, uh, or is it Mighty is one that actually looks at the, the questions of galaxy formation and evolution, again, uh, uh, one of the key science goals. And then there's others that look at molecular uh, um, molecules in the universe, masers and things like that. 
And if we look at the last two at the bottom, then these are projects that are allocated to look at um, transients from very short transients to the Thundercat, which is uh, led by Patrick Watt from UCT and Rob Fender, um, that looks at um, the transients um, from comp compact stellar uh, remnants, accretion-induced outflow, relativistic jets, and things like that. And if you look again through these, um, if you can see a little bit where there's no color, these are the four projects that are um, being done from uh, UCT with uh, international, partly with international collaborators. But well, all of them are large projects groups. So all of them have between 20 to, I think the largest one is about 80 uh, collaborators in them. But I'll, I'll, so I'll say from now on, I'll say a bit more about the four um, projects that are uh, have a PI at uh, UCT. And so the first one is uh, called La Duma. Here we have Sarah Blythe from UCT, but also Andrew ba Baker from Rutgers and Ben Holwerda from ESA. And La Duma stands for looking at the distant universe with the Meerkat array. And what the La Duma project is, it will use 5,000 hours to look at one field on the sky, the same field on the sky for 5,000 hours. Now 5,000 hours is a lot, 5,000 hours, what is it actually? It means more than 200 days of 24 hour observing time. And that means you know, the telescope would run smoothly for 24 hours per day, which I usually don't, right? So it's, it's nearly a year's worth of observations, if we're realistic, on one patch of the sky. And so, um, why do we do that? Um, one of the things is to actually look at uh, detections of H1, so the neutral gas in galaxies, in star-forming galaxies, up to a redshift of 0 0.6. And I might not, well, these are all the collaborators over here. And that might not sound so interesting, but I'll show you a bit later why. Because if we look at the, and the, at the moment on the observations that we have, direct observations of galaxies that have gas, the largest samples, the systematic surveys that we have, is less than, uh, is, is a bit over 10,000 objects that have been observed in that way. So it's completely um, different from what we have in optical galaxy surveys, the spectros spectroscopic follow-up surveys. So we know very little. The little that we do, for instance, put here in a plot where we have, this is the log of the H1 mass function. So how much mass is there in, or how many galaxies are there with a certain amount of uh, um, neutral gas in the galaxies? And that's based on very nearby galaxies. So that's a redshift of 0 0.06. So it's actually just a couple of, um, of million light years to which we probe the galaxy population. And this, this survey over here will take us actually a factor of 10 further out. And we actually would then like to look at how is the mass in galaxies distributed? Is it the same as in the local universe or does it change if we look further back in time? Does it depend on environment, etc., etc.? But one of the key questions is, and this is a very complicated plot, and you don't need to look at it overall, but this is kind of the gas density in the universe, scale to, to time, and this is the look back time as we go to the start of the universe here. This is the equivalent redshift of that period. And what you have to look at only is this is kind of the knowledge that we have at the moment, these two points of the very, very nearby universe. And that's the only direct evidence of the, of the gas in the nearby universe. If we go much, much further out, we see that there are points over here with huge error bars. Those are not direct observations. We cannot do them. We have to wait for the SKA to come. These are indirect measurements from absorption lines towards the direction of quasars. But in between, we have nothing. We know that we now have this much gas in galaxies. We know that the universe started out with lots of gas, and there must be evolution. 
but we have no information, no direct information at all. So we want, we know that it must probably go somewhere up over here and then and then go like that. Um, but we have no direct measurements and we hope to get that. As I said before, we'll hope to go out to a redshift of 0.6 with the LADUMA survey. And then another method using stacking, going out to here and then actually trace this evolution. So that's the main goal of this project and that's why it got so highly rated. And this is just to show you if uh, these are the best observations that have been done with radio telescopes to date to find high redshift gas uh, or gas in high redshift galaxies which is only out to redshift of 0.24. But this is claimed to be a detection. You can see over here, and if you bin it very hard, you can get a detection. And that's about the best measurement we had. So you can see it's not very convincing, right? Um, Mark Verheyen did something similar using Westerbork. He pointed to cluster, field inside a, a, a star forming cluster, so you think there must be gas there. That's over here, and, and some of that. Uh, and what you see over here, these are the spectra where you actually look for the signal, and you actually mostly only see noise. And now, what people have found out is a method that's called stacking, has become very popular in the last three to four years. Is what you actually do if you have this, but you want to know more about these galaxies, but we can't get it from the H1 observations is to, to actually use what we call ancillary data and look, use, for instance, optical spectroscopy. So we take galaxies that have optical spectroscopy. So we actually do know their redshift. And then what you do, you measure it also with a radio telescope. But if you look with a radio telescope, you only get noisy spectra. Then what you do is actually you use the distance of the, the objects that you know where the object is, and you actually all align them, move them, that they're all at the same distance. And then you see, look and co-add the spectra, and then in the individual spectra you don't get anything, but you know where the distance are, if you put them at the distance, then sum up the spectra, you actually start seeing the signal. And that's what's being meant by uh, stacking, and so the LADUMA project will look at the gas of galaxies that are up to a redshift of 0 0.6 and then use the statistical method of the stacking to actually trace in larger environments around clusters and things like that and co-add the spectra and learn something about the evolution of the gas content in that way. And that obviously also needs then a lot of photometry and spectroscopy if you do your uh, data well and actually some of the complementary observations are actually being done in preparation for this large project with the spectrograph uh, on uh, SALT to have that all ready when the H1 observations actually will start going. The next project um, that's being regarded is actually to look very close to galaxies um, that are very nearby and actually look at, uh, at them in incredible detail with the spatial resolution that we get with Meerkat. And here's an example of, of a galaxy, um, but what we do know if we look at galaxies is first of all relate where we have star formation with how the gas is distributed and the other is here we have the optical images of the M81 group if you map that in the gas, you can see that these, even though we have distinct objects over here, these are all related and bound by the gas over here. And sometimes even between groups and clusters you find, you find gas if you look deep enough, but our radio telescopes at the moment are not sensitive enough. So that's also kind of tracing the cosmic uh, web and that's what will be done uh, with, uh, with this project. So we'll just look at 30 nearby galaxies, but incredibly deep, the deepest observations ever of, of galaxies. And some of the things that we hope to find with these observations, if you look again here at the star-forming galaxies, these are very deep observations in H1. If you go deeper and deeper, and these are extremely long observations, you can see that the H1 gas extends even further out, and then we'll try to trace that even further with, uh, with the Laduma 
uh, with the um, uh, with the meerkat for these objects. Again, here already the the Cat Seven has been used to trace uh, one one galaxy, and it actually made a press release uh, just about ha uh, half a year ago that uh, one of the tell us that one of these dwarf galaxies was observed with Cat Seven. Actually, very very nice image uh, of the galaxy, and that's what you see. This is the dwarf galaxy down here. In the optical overlay, you have the distribution of the gas. You can actually see a rotation field. This blue is coming towards you, red is uh, going away. So uh, the, the object um, turns that way. And this object will actually be continued to be observed um, with CAT7, will form part of the PhD thesis of uh, Brad Frank. And what they want to do is actually use the CAT7. And here you have the, the kind of channel width, so that's the resolution in frequency of a galaxy, and go from here to down and make these observations much more precise. And these observations will actually then allow you to trace the, uh, the gas in much detail and do a proper fit to actually look at the dark matter distribution. And that's, uh, so that's already very exciting science that you can do with a small telescope that has that kind of, of resolution. So that's ongoing. Um, the next project is uh, MITEI. It's kind of a bit of a contrived, uh, contrived uh, name, I must say, but it stands, it's actually stands for something that I can never remember, but you can see it here. Um, and this is um, a survey that's led by Kurt von der Heijden at UCT and Matt Jarvis has a joint position here at the University of the Western Cape and Oxford. And they are leading this project. It has, this is about one of the largest collaborations, has about 80 people in there. But you can see some of the science goals. I will not go through them at all. They are uh, very consistent with some of the science goals of the SKA, so always uh, um, uh, for galaxy formation, star formation in galaxies, AGM activity over cosmic time, uh, structure formation, etc. So quite a wide range of studies. This may be interesting, but I think I have to speed up a little bit, is if you look over here at the frequency, uh, you look here at the area that you look at per um, survey that has been done so far, then if you look over here, these are existing surveys. So usually what you do if you go very deep, you can only do that for a small patch of the sky. If you do a survey, you do the whole sky, then you're up here, but you cannot go as deep because there's just not enough observing time available in the world. So these are the kind of existing um, surveys, continuum surveys, radio continuum surveys. And this is an area that has not been traced at all over here. And that is where the MIT survey comes in. And particularly this one down here outside of the plot will be the kind of comparable one to um, to the Laduma in H1, it will be the deepest continuum survey ever, even with all the existing Pathfinder projects that have been designed. So um, there's also a lot of preparation for it. There has been some observations done with Pat 7 um, and this is just a few examples of what, what it do, and to show you that, that it does work, here's the Hubble Deep Field. This is an observation of the continuum with Cat7, seven, just seven hours, and you can see quite a lot of sources standing out related to some of these very distant galaxies. And what is even more reassuring to see is that you see here um, a previous survey from the VLA, so the 27 times uh, uh, galaxies, the interferometer in the United States. And you can see how well these observations match the existing survey. So this seems to be working all quite well. Um, here is uh, just the image uh, that they have taken just as a test bed, the commissioning a science verification of uh, <coughs> my favorite uh, galaxy cluster, the Norma galaxy cluster in the Great Attractor. And you see very nice this uh, um, bent radio uh, um, galaxy in, in this cluster, which was known, but it's, it's quite exquisite how it has been observed with uh, CAT7. 
And it also looked at quite a recent discovery of a, of a cluster, um, one of the uh, observed most distant cluster that seems to be merging um, the, from two subclusters. The, the blue over here is kind of the X-ray. And again, the CAT7 is able to look at this object. And there's clearly, it's this merging cluster, quite a lot going on. We have all the sources over there. And this will be continued to be observed. So it's called the cluster El Gordo because it seems to be one of the most massive uh, clusters at those distances ever observed. And then the last one that I want to get to in the last four minutes or so is the project Thundercat. Um, and that is the one being led by uh, Patrick Wout and, and Rob Fender. And so what they are looking at is a transients and these are uh, transients that will detect like black holes or accreting uh, neutron stars and uh, other uh, events. And um, they have actually, what they plan to do is kind of a four pi sky survey with Meerkat. So Meerkat will, together with the LOFAR in the north and the, um, the ASCAP in Australia, will be able to practically monitor the whole sky um, all the time. And they will actually do this commensally with many of the other um, projects. So when other, other projects look at the sky, they will just look at that patch of sky as well and try to find the transients and then have a pipeline where they can immediately follow up and potentially a telescope will be built, or at least a proposal has been submitted, to actually put a telescope at the SAO that can, will look at the same part of the sky that the Meerkat will be looking to have immediate checkup in the optical of what's going on. So in preparation for all of that, they've also been using CAT7 for science commissioning and in particular Cecinus X1 has been, has been used and that's an accreting neutron star um, that is, uh, has a 16.6 .6 day orbit and shows relativistic jets and this is kind of the picture that you have. Here's your neutron star. We have expert in the audience for, 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 for questions. I'm not an expert on this. But it's accreting a mass from this star uh, over here. And um, you see the jets evolving over here. And what is quite exciting is this object has been quiet for a long time. But this has started showing flares that are actually very, very um, intense in, uh, in continuum. It's over one Jansky, that's very high. And CAT7 has been monitoring this source, Cenus X1, since December 2011 on a regular basis. Now, Patrick has a very nice movie to show you this. I don't have the movie, but I can show you, or I have it, but I couldn't plug it in to work. So, <laughs> so I'll go just this way. So just two, um, two examples of what you see over here. This is from 17 December 2011, and this is a couple days uh, later. And then you can see the radio image over here. And if you look just a few uh, uh, days later, you can see that it's very intense here exactly at the source. And it has a, a, a kind of a variation that has been followed up since then on a regular basis. And that actually brings me to the last slide, is that uh, this object, because it's so exciting in what's happening, has also been observed with uh, salt and uh, using the spectrograph over there. And that um, has been very exciting to follow that. It's also being observed in the near infrared, as far as I know, and in between also with uh, the uh, uh, dish at the Heart of Base Cook Observatory. But it also shows you how important it is to actually look at these objects in different wavelengths. And that's why I also highlight part-time the, the observations that we can do simultaneously with SALT. Because the radio data alone don't bring all the science. It's only together with the other multi-wavelength um, observations that you can really make a strong science case. And in that, we are actually very lucky here to, to have salt as well. I thought it was a good note to end and hand over to David over here. So that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say.
Thank you very much. It was most interesting. I think we have time for one question, and uh, otherwise we are pinching Dave's time. Keith. Um, after SKA is completed, will CAT and Meerkat be merged with it or continue to be operated as separate instruments? <laughs> I think they cannot give you the answer to that um, because it's not, not entirely clear what will happen. So in principle, the decision from the, uh, the SKA consortium was to expand the Meerkat and that it will become the SKA phase one. So another mm -hmm. 190 dishes will be built in addition to the Meerkat. The Meerkat would be the core of the larger thing that would then have 250 dishes. So as we said, kind of a 10% SKA. Um, but um, at the moment, um, they have given the tender out to build the dishes, so that will happen. But it may well be that in the time and the design review that will be happening, that they're not quite happy with the current design mm. and that they might want to change that. Now, if you then make a different dish design for the other 190 telescope, which will then merge with the rest of the SKA, the 3,000 dishes, maybe you don't want them to combine. Mm. Um, maybe that will make life too difficult. So it could be that Meerkat remains a standalone uh, uh, um, observatory and that there will be a completely different thing, or it will be merged, and we don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lynette, um, for your help. Just a small token of our appreciation. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> thank you very much.